He is currently an associate professor in internal medicine at Monash University, Malaysia, based in Johor Bahru. He's an established Dharma speaker who has been regularly sharing Dharma in Malaysia, Singapore, Jakarta, Manila, Ho Chi Minh City, and Bangkok for the last two decades. He had also been invited to speak at the third, seventh, and eighth global conference on Buddhism. And due to the recent COVID-19 pandemic, and in this era of new norm, Dr. Wong's focus has now shifted to sharing Dharma online via Zoom, Facebook, and WhatsApp. So Dr. Wong has just recently published a Dharma book called Breaking Myths. It comprises a collection of sharings on the theme of breaking myths in Buddhism. This book was officially launched virtually on 18 of October 2020, which was just this month. It was broadcasted across Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia. So, without further ado, I shall now hand over to Dr. Punya Wong for his Dharma sharing tonight. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Namo Buddhaya. Good evening, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. I wish you all well, good health. My home city of Johor Bahru has just been declared a red zone today. So I can well empathize with all of you who are scattered all over Malaysia, who have been living in red zones. From now, our schools are closed and life again slows down. Please take good care of yourselves. Please don't touch your mouth, your eyes, your nose. Please wash your hands. Tonight, I'm very happy to share. And I'm especially happy that tonight, we are able to unite many Buddhist centers together. We are all streaming to each other via each other's platform. And I think that if there is one good thing which comes out of this COVID-19 pandemic, it is that it has made us realize how small the world is, how connected we are. And I'm so happy that the various centers are now holding hands, sharing resources. And I'm very happy that this first time streaming across so many centers is doing well without technical hitches. Tonight, I'm going to share on whether the Buddha only teach dukkha and his cessation because this is a commonly quoted line. In an article in Tricycle magazine, written by Venerable Biko Bodhi, and you all will be familiar that this is the Venerable who contributed much to our modern translations of the Pali Canon, having translated Anguttara Nikaya, Samyutta Nikaya, and co-translated Majjima Nikaya, he is truly a giant in the 20th and 21st century. And in this article, he actually clarified that the widely quoted praise of the Buddha, I only teach Dukkha and its cessation, found in Majjima Nikaya 22 and Samyutta Nikaya 22, is wrongly translated by none other than he himself. Venerable Bodhi had pointed out his mistranslation, which had led to a misinterpretation of the Buddha's teachings. But then, of course, he's not the first. There were many who also translated this line similarly. And Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi said, I have to confess that I am one of the perpetrators of this literally false past, for in several of my own past writings, I authoritatively cited the wrongly rendered version of the statement as proof that the Buddha's entire teaching was only about suffering and the end of suffering. But I have seen, since learned otherwise. This experience has enabled me to see how linguistic misreadings of Buddhist texts 
can give rise to wrong doctrinal interpretations and even promulgate modern myths about the meaning of Buddhism. It takes a big man to say, I made a mistake. So we must not give a wrong impression to people, especially those who are new to the Dhamma. When Bhikkhu Bodhi says that the word only must be omitted. So I only teach dukkha and its cessation is changed now to I teach dukkha and its cessation. The word only is omitted. So it is no longer restrictive and exclusive. Another giant in the world of modern translation is Ajahn Sujato. Sutta Central is a big site whereby almost everything that you will need can be found with regards to the Pali Canon. Ajahn Sujato's translation is about the same as he translates it as, all I describe is suffering and the cessation of suffering. And Ajahn Sujato also realized that yes, we have made a mistake. He said, yes, I think it's a good point. I had not really noticed that detail in the usage of Eva, but a quick scan of the many hundreds of times that idiom is used, it is clear that when in use in this form, it doesn't have an exclusive sense. Hence, he too had changed his translation to, in the past as today, what I described is suffering and the cessation of suffering. Now, in the past as today, what I described is cessation and the cessation of suffering has a very different connotation from all I described is suffering and the cessation of suffering. Or even worse, I only teach dukkha and its cessation. That's because in the English sense, only implies a very restrictive and narrow perspective. And this gives a rather negative impression of the Buddha's teachings. Only will mean no one or nothing more. Not even just, but no one or nothing more. It is simply that. And we all know that that is not true. Now I'm going to ask Sister Liming. This is a Samyutta Nikaya translated by Bhikkhu Bodhi, the connected discourses of the Buddha. Is this the word of the Buddha? Many of us think it is, but the reality is no. These are the words of Bhikkhu Bodhi. These are not the words of the Buddha. Certainly the Buddha did not speak in English. So please, this is a very important realization for all of us. When we read these suttas, remember they are like a finger pointing to the moon. The suttas point to the teachings of the Buddha. The words are the words of our translators. Well, if you can read Pali, then you will probably be closer. But the Buddha probably spoke in Magandhi, and Pali is a dialect likely to be on the west side of the Gangetic Valley. So we are thinking at this point that Pali is probably very close to Magandhi. And Pali was the dialect that was chosen to preserve the canon. So I think that it is wise for all of us who read either the translations, the modern ones, as in the ones by Bhikkhu Bodhi and Ajahn Sujato, and the old ones like in the Pali Tech Society versions, beautiful English but very archaic. Please keep in mind those are the words of the translators. They are not the words of the Buddha. But these words translated by the translators doing their very best to point to the message of the Buddha. Looking beyond words is important. Let's take a first example. Now, we are lucky that the Buddha Sasana split into three or two rather early in its history and then broke into 18 schools a little bit later. 
Why are we lucky? People will say, mm, this is bad. But no, I look at it as we actually lucky because we have now a canon in Pali. We have got a Sanskrit canon and we have a very extensive Chinese canon. And we have a Tibetan canon as well. How this helps us is because about a hundred years or so after the demise of the Buddha, it broke into two and then subsequently into so many schools. So if you have lessons or discourses or suttas which are found in the Pali canon, in the Sanskrit canon, in the Chinese agamas, and in the Tibetan canon, then that message, that discourse, that teaching is likely very old and predates the schism. If you have discourses found in only one, and not in the others, then it is very likely that this came about only after the division of the schools. And these are much later teachings. So by doing this, scholars are helping us get closer and closer to the words of the Buddha. So having texts in various languages like Sanskrit, Pali, Chinese, Tibetan, actually helps us have a better understanding of the Buddha Dharma. Now all these texts agree that the Buddha spent the first seven days after he attained perfect awakening under the Bodhi tree. The joy of jhana was his food, wisdom was his broth, his mind peaceful and without distraction. For seven days and nights he sat under the Bodhi tree and watched the Bodhi tree which played such an important role in his enlightenment. This is an icon, iconography, Buddha sitting underneath the Bodhi tree with the characteristic heart-shaped leaves touching the earth, which is the usual mudra for the moment of enlightenment. Now, what the Buddha did was teaching us a lesson, a lesson in profound gratitude without having even said a single word. Profound gratitude to the Bodhi tree that sheltered him during his struggle. Uneventful, but he had silently taught a great moral lesson to the world. Gratitude. We must have gratitude for all our teachers, our parents, and all who have helped us. Often, when I ask students, what is the first lesson the Buddha gave? Many will say, oh, the middle path, the Dhamma Chaka Pawatana, or the noble truths. But no, the very first lesson the Buddha gave was a lesson in gratitude. And that is something that we should learn. And it is a lesson not in words, not in speech, but by action. Now, we all share the Dhamma in outreach. And very often we are happy because we manage to help someone. And oftentimes we are sad because we didn't manage to be successful. And now and then we even get severely criticized, given very unkind words, etc. That is to be expected. But what if it is the Buddha himself who is saying, who is talking? Now many people do not realize that the very first person the Buddha actually spoke to and shared the Dhamma was a man called Upaka, not the five ascetics, as he was walking towards the place where the five ascetics were staying, he actually passed this man called Upaka. Upaka had a discussion with him, and the Buddha explained that he had overcome all foes, I am always free from stains in every way, I have left everything and have obtained emancipation by the destruction of desire. Having myself gained knowledge, whom shall I call my master? I have no teacher. No one is equal to me in the world of men and of gods. No being is like me. I am the holy one in the world. I am the highest teacher. I alone am the absolute Sambuddha. I have gained coolness by the extinction of all passion and have obtained 
Nirvana. Now you would have thought that when someone is spoken to by the Buddha, it would likely have an effect. But Upaka replied, you profess then, friend, to be the holy absolute jina, that being a Buddha-like figure in Jainism. And the Buddha said, like me are all jinas who have reached the extinction of the asavas. Asavas means defilements. I have overcome all states of unwholesomeness. Therefore, Upaka, am I the jina? You will often hear venerables being called venerable jina, jina this, jina that, because of this word. When he had spoken thus, Upaka, instead of accepting, listening, showing respect, replied, It may be so, friend, shook his head, took another road, and went away. Now, the very first person that the Buddha shared the Dhamma to was a disappointment. It didn't turn out well, in fact. So, do not be discouraged. For all of us who are in Dhamma Dutta work, when we fail, when we succeed, do not rejoice too much. When you get caught names, well, just let it roll you off, roll off you like water off a lotus leaf and carry on. Now, can everyone understand the Dhamma? There are centers in Malaysia that have been sharing the Dhamma for 20, 30, 40 years. They would have reached a lot of people. But can everyone understand the Dhamma? This is what the Buddha himself said. Must I now preach what I so hardly want? Men sung in sin and lust would find it hard to plumb this doctrine. Upstream all the way, obtuse, profound, most subtle, hard to grasp, dear lust will blind them that they shall not see. In densest mist, Ignorance be formed. Wow, such beautiful English, almost like English literature that we study in secondary school. And this is because I purposely chose one of the early translations, those translated at the turn of the 20th century, usually by English missionaries trying to convert and then instead found the beauty of the Dhamma. Now, this is a beautiful poetic expression that not everyone would understand the Dhamma, especially those who are blinded by sensual gratification. A generation blinded by sensual gratification will hardly wish to see the Dhamma because they do not see a need for the Dhamma. That is why one of the most common questions I'm asked is, oh, my children are not interested. Oh, I find it hard to reach my children. Well, the reason is very simple. Your children are exactly, what is happening to your children is exactly what any parent will do. That is to protect them and give them the best, solve all their problems, transfer all their problems over, and basically they lead a good life full of sensual pleasures. In that state, there is no need for the Dhamma. What need of the Dhamma is there when you do not see Dukkha? So even the Buddha here is saying that when you have eyes that are blinded by lust, in densest mist of ignorance be fought. Such beautiful English. Not everyone would understand, nor appreciate, nor want the Dhamma. For someone to find the Dhamma attractive, most of the time, he had seen Dukkha, experienced Dukkha, and once an escape from Dukkha. While this is a beautiful lesson in beautiful poetic English, however, those people who translated these at that time of the early 20th century had a Christian or a Western background. So they would have translated it to concepts that they understand. And here I have put in color the word sin. There is actually no concept of sin in the Buddha Dharma. It's just wholesome deeds, unwholesome deeds giving rise to cause and effect. There is no such concept of sin to be forgiven, sin to beg for forgiveness, or sin to be washed in blood. 
So this is an example that when it is translated by someone in an other culture or in another educational background, he is likely to translate it in his interpretation based on his background. So while this is beautiful, it can mislead. Now, sensual pleasures certainly will blind us. Now, even if the bee could explain to the fly why pollen and honey is so much better than shit, the fly would not understand because the fly is so engulfed by the beauty of shit. If you are a deva, if you are a deva serving the Buddha Sasana and you look at us mortals, playing games on the internet, doing all kinds of crazy things, getting drunk in pubs, fighting, etc., etc. It will be exactly like a bee looking at a fly circling a hump of shit. That would be the exact scenario. But we are enjoying that shit so much that we do not want to get out of it. So yes, it is true. Sensual pleasures will certainly blind us. Now, the Buddha's teachings are very honest and direct. How many of you are aware of what he taught in Anguttara Nikaya 1.1? Well, if you are not, open Anguttara Nikaya, look at the first discourse, and you'll be shocked. It reads almost like a modern Playboy magazine extract. And the Buddha said, I do not know because of a form that overpowers the mind of a man as much as because the form of a woman. The form of a woman because overpowers the mind of a man. I do not know because of a sound, odor, taste, touch that overpowers the mind of a man as much as because the sound, odor, taste, touch of a woman. The sound, odor, taste, touch of a woman because overpowers the mind of a man. Very, very direct. No two ways about it. And this is how the Buddha would have taught us. The Dhamma is built on telling the truth, not telling people what they want to hear. It is on reality. People want to hear a lot of things. Li Ming wants to hear that if I is to dana 100 ringgit to Subang Jaya Buddhist Association, I will get back a thousand ringgit, a tenfold increase. That's nice, everybody wants that. But that's being naive. In fact, ridiculous. And similarly, a murderer also wants to hear, yes, I've done horrible things, but if I believe in ABC, everything is wiped off, like the chalk wiped off a blackboard. Yes, people want to hear that. Very nice, very comforting. Even a murderer will be comforted. But is it real? The Buddha asks us to use our logic mind, common sense, is it real? Is it possible? So the Buddha Dharma is not expected to be a religion of the masses. First, it does not offer you comforting lines. It does not tell you you'll be forgiven. It does not promise you a paradise somewhere. It does not take away all your troubles. Instead, it tells you the truths, no matter how unpleasant. So it's not going to be a religion of the masses because a religion of the masses has to, quote, Karl Marx, be an opiate of the masses. The masses who are suffering once opium. Opium does not take away their problem, but opium comforts them. And Karl Marx noted, that religion is the opiate of the masses. The Buddha Dharma, unfortunately, 
for anyone who's hoping to make it a popular religion, does not offer these things. If there is a God, he will have to beg my forgiveness. And this was carved in a concentration camp cell by one of the poor inmates. These people in them, every one of them would have prayed hard, prayed very, very hard. But they still had very, very unfortunate and tragic outcomes. So unlike popular religions, there is no forgiveness or a promised land or a promise to give what is sought or asked. Instead, people seek for and buy what they want. So you want forgiveness, someone will sell you forgiveness. And the Buddha wants us to realize that you must take refuge in wisdom. When you take refuge in the Buddha Dharma Sangha, as we all did just now, led by Brother Tuan, you are actually taking refuge in wisdom. The Buddha became the Buddha because of the Dhamma. The Dhamma is what is going to help us. The Sangha are the people living 24-7, living, protecting, preserving the Dhamma. You are taking refuge in wisdom. Someone else who takes refuge in an external power is taking refuge in power. The power to forgive, the power to transfer you to another realm, the power to wash, to clean. If that power is true, real, fine. But if that power is not true, then you are in serious trouble. Now, this is a very powerful power, very attractive. In this era of COVID-19, we are washing and washing and washing like crazy. And here is one that is so powerful, you will even wash away your sins. But if you are to use your wisdom, are you laughing at this slide? Or are you honestly going to rush out now and buy this bottle to wash away your sins? Do you honestly think it would work? Well, I will leave you to answer that. Instead, the Buddha taught, long life is welcome, agreeable, pleasant, and hard to obtain in the world. Beauty is welcome, agreeable, pleasant, and hard to obtain in the world. So is happiness, so is status, so is a rebirth in heaven. Everyone, is praying and praying and praying for long life, for beauty, for happiness, for position, status, and a heavenly rebirth. And the Buddha tells you in no uncertain terms. He said, now I tell you, these five things are not to be obtained by reason of prayers or wishes. Take a look around you. If prayers work, Everybody will live forever. Everybody will be beautiful. Everybody will be so happy. There will be no Yemen. There will be no Middle East wars. There will be no tragedies all over the world. Everybody will be rich and powerful. But is it so? If you are to obtain this by reasons of prayers or wishes, the Buddha said, who here would like them? Human beings have been praying for 200,000 years. And yet we are still looking at the same problems that they had 200,000 years ago. And the Buddha said, it is not fitting for the disciple of the noble ones who desire long life to pray for it. And then the Sutta goes on to repeat every one of them, beauty, happiness, status, rebirth in heaven. Instead, the disciple of the noble one, if you want long life, then you jolly well follow the path of practice which leads to long life. Go exercise. Don't eat so much carbohydrate. Cut down on fat. In fact, eat as little as possible. Then you will have long life. Very, very practical, pragmatic advice. Very realistic. But having said all that, someone will say, yeah, just let me pray. Lah. If I can pray and get long life, wow, so much better. No need exercise, no need this, no need that. Well, that is what you want to buy, as I said. Whether McDonald's sells it to you, I don't know. But that is what you're trying to buy, like a burger. Now, 
Dukkha is inevitable. Dukkha as in stress, discomfort, disease, aging, all this, as long as we live, your knees, your back, they are going to hurt. Your prostate is going to block, etc., etc. To survive all that stress given by your boss, all that stress given by COVID-19, all that stress given by Subang Jaya Exco, to survive all that, you've got to find some meaning within this dukkha. And I'm so glad that so many people in this circle, within the Buddha Sasana, they have all found meaning. I see that the internet is now actually quite saturated by so many societies in Malaysia, outside Malaysia, all doing their very best. I see societies raising money for Myanmar. I see societies doing all kinds of good things. Whatever it is, the point is you have to find a meaning for yourself within this life of ours. The purpose of life is a life of purpose. So if your meaning is Dhamma Dutta work, fine. If your meaning is to support Dhamma Dutta work, fine. If your meaning is to raise money to help the poor, the orphaned, etc., fantastic. If your meaning is simply to raise your family well, fantastic. But whatever it is, you must have a purpose in life, and that is a life of purpose. When a life has no purpose, that's when you are going to be exposed to all kinds of unwholesome things, from alcohol to bad company, etc., etc. So the Buddha taught us not just dukkha, but how to live with purpose every day. And every day as we wake up, we have another day in front of us, and the Buddha said to us, avoid all evil. For today, try your best. Cultivate good again. Do whatever little good you can and cleanse one's mind. And he said, this is the teachings of all the Buddhas, not just him. The Buddhas of the past and the Buddhas of the future, they similarly teach the same thing. So when you wake up tomorrow morning, make a little pledge that you will avoid all evil wherever possible, cultivate whatever good that you can, and cleanse your mind. What is the meaning of life? Before long, life ends in death. So whatever is worthwhile and good should be done without any delay. Now, before COVID-19 came and struck us with a big blow, most Malaysian men will reach up to 74, 75 years old. Most Malaysian women, 80 years old. So if you look at 75, you spend the first 25 years of your life studying very hard, trying to get a profession. The next 25 years of your life, feeding your family, doing whatever you can for your family. And many of us now are in the last 25 years of our life. That is if you follow the statistical average. You have only 25 years of your life in the last third. Make sure we use that time very well. With COVID-19, we can't even tell how much time we have left. And that is one of the great teachings of the Buddha. We think we have time. We actually do not know. Now, this is another wonderful teaching which I found so much strength in. The Buddha said, if you gain a mature companion, a fellow traveler, right living and wise, overcoming all dangers, Go with him, gratified, mindful. I.e., if you have kalyana meters in your vicinity, workplace, your place where you go to study the Dhamma, the place where you go for fellowship, or now interact with on the internet, then this is truly worth his weight in gold. He is your kalyana meter because he encourages you on the rightful, Rightful living, the eightfold path, 
He drags you out when you are fallen down into the drums, the drags of life. He encourages you. He gives you strength. He supports you. And you are not walking alone. Fantastic. But the Buddha too realized that sometimes you do not have such a situation. And sometimes, in fact, there might be some not very nice people in your immediate company or even worse. So he said, if you don't gain a matured companion, a fellow traveler, right living and wise, then wander alone like a king renouncing his kingdom, like the elephant in the Mantanga wilds is heard. This is from the Rhinoceros Sutta. Meaning, if you do not have someone or a group of friends who are very good, who are supportive, then you may have to walk away like the Buddha himself did at the quarrel at Kosambi when his monks quarreled very badly at Kosambi. So never stop being a good person because of bad people. There will always be good people, bad people, not so good, not so bad people. But we do not need to stop being a good person. Now, another thing which the Buddha Dharma clearly taught us is there should be no place for superstition. I go to Thailand every now and then before COVID-19 locked us all in. And Thailand has the best and the worst. You have very good centers teaching the Buddha Dharma in the best possible ways. Round the corner, you have somebody selling anything from blessing to amulets to you name it. So it's a study in contrast. And I saw this in the internet just a few days ago, or maybe a week ago, that a Buddhist temple in the province of Kampyang, Pe, had erected signs advising visitors to look elsewhere if they seek superstitious help from its monks. Amulets for sale, the anointing of cars, even the distribution of holy water. The abbot said that the monks are there to discuss religious matters, not offer voodoo guarantees of good fortune. And this is a sadhu, sadhu, sadhu welcome trend for the Thai temples to shun practices that stray from the teachings of the Buddha. Any one of us who knows the Dhamma will know that there is no such thing as amulets, anointing of cars, and the distribution of holy water. Another question often asked, in my years of sharing, people will become friends. And one common question is, what happens when I die? Well, my standard answer is, they will give your hospital bed to another patient. That is very Zen, very true. In the present moment, no speculation involved. It truly is the truth. When you die, they will give your hospital bed to another person. Now, the Buddhist teachings do not involve speculation. Live mindfully in the present moment, in this life. Your deeds today, if you do them well, do not worry or fear what happens after your death. Just keep your precepts. Follow the Noble Eightfold Path. And here I put in a little nice story. Someone came and asked the Zen master, what happens after we die? And the master said, I don't know. And he said, what do you mean? Aren't you a Zen master? And he said, yes, I am, but I'm not a dead one. I like this. Very in the moment. No speculation. What are you doing now? The cause, if you plant a good, wholesome cause, you do not have to worry about the effects. The core teaching of the Buddha revolves around cause and effect. He taught us to avoid superstitions, hearsay. And he even told us whether it is our culture, our holy book, or our teacher, or anything for the matter. Put it to the test. Put it to a simple test. And that test, the Buddha said, merely involves, are these things good? Are these things not blamable? Are these things praised by the wise? And when undertaken and observed, do they lead to benefit and happiness? Four things. 
Okay, are they good? Not blamable, praised by the wise, and when done, leads to benefit and happiness. So it is a very simple four-way test. Whether it is your culture, whether it is your tradition, whether it is your education, your teacher, etc. Put it to the test. If your answer is a resounding yes to all four, then the Buddha said, abide in them. A very practical guideline given to us by the Buddha. Now, this is not in the canon. I am not aware of a tea ceremony in the canon. But it is good. It is not blamable. It is praised by the wise. And it leads to benefit and happiness. So I would say, let us enter on and abide in them. Because this is a lesson in gratitude, respect, humility. Something we should continue. So is Qingming. So is what we do in Chinese New Year. It's not in the canon for sure. But it is good. It is not blamable. It is praised by the wise. And it leads to benefit and happiness. Gender. Gender as in sex. During the Buddha's time, there's a strong belief that giving birth to a baby girl first may be unlucky. I do not know about your own family experiences, but I've certainly come across in a generation above me, or maybe two generations above me, when people gave birth to a baby girl first, and they would have given that baby girl away. Because they don't want the first child to be a baby girl. Even in Malaysia. Now this is in the Buddhist time, and Queen Malika, the queen of King Pasanadi of Kosala, had given birth to a daughter. King Pasanadi of Kosala happened to be with the Buddha at the point, and news was brought to him that his queen, Queen Malika, had given birth to a daughter. And King Pasanadi was displeased, hearing that his queen had given birth to a baby girl while he wanted a boy. We have to understand King Pasanadi is a man of his era, of his culture. Now, the Buddha disclosed the fault of such superstitions, confirming that such beliefs are meaningless. But the Buddha put it to Queen Malika, sorry, to King Pasanadi in a way a modern counselor would be proud. He used absolutely brilliant counseling techniques. What little counseling classes that I attended in the university, it's in here. First principle in counseling, do not argue with the client. Do not disagree with the client. He is not here to start an argument with you. Listen to the client. Help the client see, but do not argue. So the Buddha told King Pasanadi, a woman, O Lord of the people. O Lord of the people. He's the king of the all. So you must give him his due respect. May turn out better than a man. The Buddha didn't say, a woman is better than a man, because that would have made King Pasanadi immediately turn away. His culture is such that a man is superior. So the Buddha used very good counseling techniques. A woman, O oh Lord of the people, may turn out better than a man. Suggest it to the client. Let the client figure it out himself. She may be wise and virtuous. Well, that is why she may be better. She may be a devoted wife. Well, in King Pasanadi's era, a devoted wife is probably number one on the list of to do. Revering her mother-in-law, that's probably number two in the list. And more important, give birth to a son. That's number three. The Buddha had made use of what King Pasanadi's culture and belief, things that he holds on to strongly. Use that. That son to whom she gave birth may become a hero, O Lord of the land. The son of such a blessed woman may even rule the realm. Look at the counseling technique here. Look at the way he comforted him. 
Anyone who listened to this will say, yeah, 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 you're right. You're absolutely right. Now, this is what I mean by looking beyond the words. Any counselor in this group reading this would have been proud of the Buddha, even though the Buddha never claimed to be a professionally trained counselor. In fact, we probably will learn from him. Now, I told you earlier that the Buddha's teachings do not tell you false promises, do not tell you all your problems will go away. Instead, it tells you to deal with reality. Problems will be there. Deal with it. Ayakema said, it is often taught that the Buddha's doctrine teaches one that suffering will disappear if one has meditated long enough or if one sees everything differently. It is not that at all. Suffering isn't going to go away, and that's realistic. But the one who suffers, that concrete being that we perceive him to be, is going to go away. He is going to realize he's not a concrete being. He's going to realize that he can change. He's going to realize that he can have a different attitude and that his mental attitude is not cast in stone. He is going to realize the realities of life and adapt to it. The Buddha's teachings also include a lot of things on family life. The Sigalo Vada Sutta is familiar to everyone here, I assume. But there are lots of teachings with regards to the duties of a husband, duties of a wife, duties of children, duties of teachers, etc. And of course, in the modern era, there are so many books available, all expanding on what the Buddha taught. And I hope you realize that your spouse is your in-house Dhamma teacher. And your house is the potential Buddha. Please take good care of your potential Buddha. Tenzin Palmo, beloved of all of us, she gave a wonderful explanation of what is attachment versus love. And attachment is the very opposite of love. Love says, I want you to be happy. If I am also happy, fantastic. But I want you to be happy. And you can see that example in your parents. Attachment says, I want you to make me happy. So when a boyfriend tells a girlfriend that I love you, it is with condition A, B, C, D, E, F, G, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Whole long list of condition. You must do this, you must do that, you mustn't do this, you mustn't do that. Because if not, I'll be unhappy. So what is love? An unenlightened attachment says, for I, the love, Thai love, is a jealous love. I possess you. But metta, which is what the Buddha wants us to have, says, I am happy because you are happy. Today, a very good friend of mine, the daughter got married in Australia. Unfortunately, because of COVID-19, it is again a marriage conducted via internet to the relatives in Malaysia. But I think that this is a wonderful lesson that I would like to share with this newly wedded couple. If you love each other, the word I does not exist anymore. It is the word we. If you love each other, you will do your best to make the other person happy. Attachment, of course, will be there at the beginning, but you will learn to evolve. This attachment will slowly change to love and hopefully to metta. Metta, the Buddha said, is best illustrated by the love shown by a mother to her only child. And those of you who are parents in this group will know exactly what I mean. I want you to be happy. I will be happy because you are happy. Now, the Buddha even gave teachings on career guidance. Now, how many of you realize as you read the Dhamma that right livelihood is part of the Eightfold Path? You know, we read it and then we just, you know, read it and brush it aside. But it's very important for all of us to realize 
that right livelihood is part of the Eightfold Path. The Buddha stands unique among all the spiritual teachers in that he actually puts livelihood as one of the steps of the spiritual path. Your work, your career is not separate from your spiritual life. Your work, what you do every day to earn the bread on your table is part of your spiritual life. A fulfilling career is right livelihood. One of the steps of the Eightfold Path. And the Buddha very clearly defined it as earning your living in ways that are not harmful to others. Now, life need not be suffering. There is a lot of suffering in life, but life need not be suffering if you know the Dhamma, if you know how to adapt, and of course, if you know how to cope, it makes life easier. This is my first son-in-law. I love him very much. He's a fantastic cook. He loves to eat. And so whenever I meet him, we eat. So life need not be suffering. There is a lot of suffering in life. But life need not be suffering if you know Dhamma. If you know how to move like water around a rock. If you know how to cook, it's even better. Now I no longer ask my students when I meet them after they have graduated and are working, whether they've got postgraduate qualifications or hospital appointments, whether they are registrars, consultants, blah, blah, blah. I used to ask that. Now I just ask them, are you happy? Because I think that that is far more important than anything else. So to all my students who are listening in now, are you happy? Maybe you can write a message in to let the Koko and Che Che here know. Now, happy person is happy not because everything is right in his life. He is happy because his attitude towards everything in his life is right. My dream, of course, is to have no further wishes or dreams. The Buddha taught that the man who sleeps content at night is the richest man. The Buddha gave advice even with regards to eating meat. And many of you will be familiar with the Jivaka Sutta. And here the Buddha taught Dr. Jivaka, who is actually his personal doctor, that there are three instances in which meat may be eaten. When it is not seen, not heard, not suspected that that meat or that living being had been intentionally killed. So if Sister Li Ming goes to the hypermarket, and buys it off the shelf. That's fine. But if Sister Li Ming is to go to the aquarium in the restaurant and I say, that fish, I want that fish, kill it. Well, that's not fine because it would affect her mind state. So we are now living in an era whereby my Singaporean friends, their children thinks that chicken comes from NTUC. Not from a farm, but from NTUC because it is now so mechanical. Everything comes pre-packed. So what the Buddha is teaching here is basically how is it going to affect your mind? If you have seen it being killed, then it's going to affect you because you've probably seen the animal being killed and you might have some attachment. If you even heard it or even suspect that it was intentionally killed for you, then it is better that you don't eat it because it's going to have repercussions in your mind state. This is especially so in a small town, a rural community. Now, all of us are at different stages of our spiritual path. Should you at any step or any way along that path feel that you would rather not even buy off the supermarket shelf, then by all means proceed if it is to make your mind state better. But the Buddha in no way made it a rule. Detachment does not mean that you own nothing. It means that nothing should own you. Now, people have a misconception that the Buddha said we have to let go of everything. No, you do not have to let go of everything. These are listed under upadanas, attachments or clingings. And the Buddha said that these clingings, these attachments, yes, 
these are the things we have to slowly learn to let go of. Because if you are very attached to these four categories, it is unlikely you will be able to perceive, understand the Dhamma. So what are these four clingings, these four attachments? Clinging to sensuality, karma upadana. Many people are very, very attached to sensual pleasures. While it is impossible for all of us to just drop it, you can gradually lessen it and let it not have such a strong hold on you. Sensual pleasures can range from going dancing to having one particular exotic taste to having whatever stimulates your senses. Reduce it gradually. That is what the Buddha said we need to let go so that your life is a calm, peaceful life and not one driven by adrenaline. Clinging to views, michaditi, views. These views have to slowly be lessened. You know, we are very, very attached to our views. People can say something against what I believe, and I can even murder a person if he believes in it so strongly. These examples are all over the world for us to see. People cling to these views so strongly that only my way is correct. It's only my way which is the right way. My lineage which is correct. All others are wrong. My way or the highway, etc. These clinging to views, I am sure if all of us in the audience now reflect on it, you will understand exactly what the Buddha meant. Some people are so strongly clung to their views that even at their last breath, they will not let go of a view. Whether it is true, whether it is not true, immaterial. It is a will which they have clung on to for so long and so strongly that if they let go of it, they feel that their whole life has been lived in vain. So they cling on to it. Clinging to rules and rituals. A lot of people are very religious. Religious under inverted commas in front of many people. Duly following a routine of Rites, rituals, pujas, etc., etc. Now, the Buddha told us that what is important is not the external, but the in the mind, the internal. So, the mere attachment to rules and rituals and rites, that is not going to make you enlightened. And finally, of course, clinging to the wrong view, the ego perception of a self, a concrete self, a solid self, that is, of course, probably the strongest of our attachments. Even as you lay dying, many people are so strongly attached, they refuse to let go. And this, the Buddha said, these four upadanas, they are the fuel, the petrol, the kerosene that leads to rebirth, the fuel for rebirth. And this, we have to slowly learn to de-attach, to disengage from. Now, the Buddha's only show the way. I like this cartoon strip, O Lady, O Man. Al, have you heard of the 10 most powerful two-letter words? Husband, as usual, titapa attitude. No, it doesn't ring a bell. And the wife said, if it is to be, it is up to me. And Al says, that's very profound. I like it. This is very much in tune with the Buddha Dharma. Maybe this couple are Buddhists. Divine messengers. People talk of gods and devas, but the Buddha talk of a deva dutta, an ambassador of the gods. And what are the ambassadors of the gods the Buddha taught us? They are like massive boulders coming towards us, only that you refuse to see it. They come in from all sides, from all directions. This is aging and death. Every time you see aging, you see death. It is a divine messenger, an ambassador of the gods talking to you, telling you, use your time well. Use your life well. You look at this old man, for example. I got a shock when I saw the video a few weeks ago. Now, it is challenging to practice as you get older. It is even more challenging to practice when you are ill. 
It is impossible to practice when you are dead. All the rites and rituals at your funeral won't serve anything. You should remind yourself continually of aging, illness, and death. In fact, this is one of the protective meditations the Buddha wanted us to do. Every day he said, recall aging, sickness, and death. Then you will live your life better. Use your time better. Motivate yourself to practice and avoid doing unwholesome things. Now, the greatest gift is the gift of the Dhamma. To me, the second greatest gift is the gift of time. Because I can give you anything. I can give Sister Li Ming a book. I can always buy another one. I can even give Sister Li Ming pocket money. I can always earn pocket money. But once I have given Sister Li Ming my time, it is impossible for me to get back my time. It is gone forever. So when my daughters got married, the first daughter got married, this pocket watch was given to me by my late father-in-law. I gave this to my first son-in-law and I reminded him that all I need from you is not money. All I need from you is a time that you and my daughter can spend with me and my wife. So similarly, when my second daughter got married, I gave this watch, my own watch, to the second son-in-law, and I told him the same message. And with time, I gave the first son-in-law my father's, my late father's watch. I gave the second son-in-law this pocket watch and my first watch to remind them that time is what I need from them. Unfortunately, COVID-19 has put a halt to much of my plans. Now, the Buddha even taught medical ethics. How many of you are aware that the Buddha even taught medical ethics? How to be a good doctor. I do not need to go through this. Suffice for it that you all know that he gave even advice to those people who are practicing medicine administering to the sick how they should go about it. He even taught you who were sick how to be a good patient. What are the qualities of a good patient? Amazing. If you want to know the details, just Google it. It's all there in the internet. And for, of course, for lots and lots of devotees, they come and pray and pray and pray and they want protection. They seek an amulet, they seek a blessing, they seek a venerable to spray some water over their heads because they want to be protected. But what does the Dhamma tell us about protection? The Dhamma protects those who live by the Dhamma. The Dhamma well practiced brings bliss. This is the reward when the Dhamma is well practiced. One who lives by the Dhamma doesn't go to a bad destination. For Dhamma, and non don't bear equal results. Non-dhamma leads you to a bad destination, dhamma to a good destination. Your amulet is the practice of the dhamma. Your amulet is not to be blessed by some venerable or have holy water given to you. So let us strive diligently with mindfulness. Whatever little merit that you do will not be wasted, just like water, never goes anywhere. It's all the time around in various forms. It will never vanish, even a drop. Do not believe, act. And even a simple thing, like a spider or a cricket, why kill it? Take it, throw it away outside. One day, you might be in a similar situation. Let's hope someone shows you the same mercy. How will you know whether you are making any progress? You will know it. What makes you mad now makes you laugh. And finally, the Buddha taught even businessmen like many of my Kayana meters in JB how to do business. When it comes to business, everyone wants profits. The Buddha gave guidelines on this and not sacrifice the bottom line of profit. First and foremost, you have to define your goal. 
and the Buddha said that it must be like a bee collecting pollen. Doesn't harm the flower. Right livelihood, middle way. Your business, remember cause and effect. Your customer, remember metta karuna. Your business strategies, be mindful of impermanence, be flexible and innovative, and always apply ethical principles, respect for colleagues and customers, application of the five precepts. And how to use money wisely? Well, we are all familiar with this in the Siga Uluwada Sutta. With wealth that you acquire righteously, one portion for your wants, two portions for your business, and one portion for emergencies. Now we are in COVID-19. That fourth portion is coming in. We are all living on that fourth portion. So people prefer hearing pleasant, comforting lies than plainful truths. We actually teach ourselves. The Dhamma merely points the way. We trust the Buddha's words. We trust the translator's words. We trust Bhikkhu Bodhi. We trust Ajahn Sujata. But please verify it. Thank you. Thank you, brothers and sisters. I hope that I had helped you in some way. May you be safe in this difficult time. May you be happy. May you be well. Sadhu. 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 Thank you very much, Dr. Punya, for such an enlightening and eye-opening Dharma sharing session tonight. I believe our viewers here do concur with me. Eh? Dr. Punya's talk is always very interesting and thought-provoking. Yeah, where he just uses simple analogies yeah, and examples that you know we are able to easily relate to uh, and to explain something which may seem rather complex for some to you know uh, understand or to comprehend. So you know some of the points that um, Dr. Wong actually highlighted in his talk tonight actually did touch on some of our cultural belief system yeah, that have been infused into our lives. So without us even realizing that it may not actually be the truth yeah, the teachings of the Buddha. Yeah. So thank you very much, Dr. Punya, for debunking all these myths, you know, wrong views, beliefs, superstitions that all of us may have. All right. So now it's time for the question and answer session where we will, you know, collect, um, gather questions from our viewers to be answered by our speaker. So if you have any questions, please, yeah, post it in the comment box. Yeah. And we will. Um, ask the speaker, yeah, ask Dr. Punya. All right. So keep the questions coming in, right? So meanwhile, um, one of the questions that was raised, yeah, which uh, something, you know, many people would like to know, yeah, uh, if one is a Taoist by religion, then can he or she practice uh, Dharma in his uh, daily life too? Well, let me put it this way. The Buddha did not teach a religion. He teach a way of life. You can be a Christian and learn the Dhamma and practice the Noble Eightfold Path and also see Anicca Dukkha Anatta. There are this group of people called Bu Jews, Buddhist Jews. So they call themselves Bu as in Buddhist Jew, Bu Jew. And there are a lot of famous people who are Bujus. There are lots of Western Buddhists, very eminent, who are actually originally Jews, who adapted uh, the Buddha Dharma. So if you are a Taoist from, I believe, family background, because uh, Malaysian Chinese practices are a mixture of Taoism, Buddhism, spiritualism, etc., etc., you can, of course, also learn the Buddha Dharma, adapt your life to be in tune with the Noble Eightfold Path and see by yourself the three universal characteristics. After all, whether you call yourself a Taoist, a Buddhist, a Muslim, a Hindu, a Christian, a Jew, it is just a label. It is our karma, and that is what you do, which is important. After you and I die, nobody bothers. You can't bring your IC card with you, you know. I mean, 
they may burn it for you, but you can't bring it along with you and say, see, 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 it's written there. I'm a whatever. So it is what you have done in your life, and that is your karma, your coming actions. That is important. So by all means, if you are a Taoist, Buddhist, Hindu, Christian, Muslim, whatever, practice whatever you are practicing, and you can still learn the Buddha Dharma, you can still apply it. All right? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, um, Practicing um, Dharma is actually a way of life, isn't it? Right? Yeah, so um, I think the next question that we have from one of our sisters, Sister Jeanette Ang. Am I right to have gratitude to the Deva? Yeah, that asked, um, uh, who asked Buddha to stay on and teach? Yeah, um, because he thinks that human won't be able to understand the Dharma. Yeah, um, Brahma Sahampati. If you follow the Thai tradition, in their practice, before every Dhamma talk, there'll be a person who will recite that line taken verbatim where Rama Sahampati made that appeal to the Buddha. And so, yes, if you say, uh, can I be grateful to the day one who made the appeal or invite the Buddha to teach here? By all means, yes, yes, yes. That's perfectly all right. And as I said, in the Thai lineage, they actually recall the good deed by the Deva every time before a Dhamma talk begins. Somebody will chant the invitation. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Right. We, another question is coming in now. Right. So, um, by Tim A. Piao. All right. Um, after the Buddha's enlightenment, yeah, he spent the first week at peace and in bliss under the Bodhi tree. But he only expressed gratitude and performed Animisa Lokchana in the second week by gazing at the tree from a distance for seven days. So I just want to clarify this issue. Is this not so? Well, there is some disagreements within the canon as how the Buddha spent the first seven weeks. To me, that is actually not very important. But if you are very interested, there are some academic papers whereby people actually looked at the three lineages of that I mentioned earlier and compared and try and come to a conclusion what the Buddha did. And what I quoted at the beginning of this talk, that was actually verbatim from one of the papers that I found, an academic paper by an academician. And that's why I said all three lineages agree on that. Another person who did fantastic work is Sister Sylvia Bay. If you are keen on what happened and the differences even within the Pali Canon as to how he spent his time, then do download Sister Silver Bay's book. It's also available free on the internet and that will help you clarify better what the Buddha did in the first week, second week, third week, fourth week, etc. But you may be a bit disappointed because even within the Pali Canon, different sites give different opinions but to me that's a minor point it's not really that important the important is reading beyond the line what is the lesson that the buddha was teaching us all right um you if you want the book just google uh sylvia bay b-a-y uh, sylvia is an usual sylvia and bay is b-a-y and you will find the link to her book all right thank you so much yeah uh, for this uh, q a session so there you are, yeah? Did the Buddha only teach Dukkha and its cessation? So now you know, yeah? Our speaker gave us a very crystal clear explanation tonight. Yeah, the Buddha taught us many other things, yeah? About uh, gratitude, yeah, wisdom, how to live your life with a purpose, yeah? How to be happy and many more, all right? So like you said, life need not be suffering if you know Dharma, right? So practice now. Thank you, everyone, for all the questions posted and to Dr. Punya once again for sharing Dharma with us tonight. As he has quoted in his talk, the greatest gift is that of the Dharma, isn't it? Right? So let us rejoice together. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs>